Thank you, everybody. Uh, so I'm Jason. I've given Exponix talks the last two talk Asia. So this is the newest one in the series. Uh, quick one, who am I? I'm a Gentoo developer, as Roland said. I'm the lead on the Exponix team and the hardened project. Uh, I'm also an upstream Exponix maintainer. Uh, I also do TensorFlow and other things too, but that's not relevant now. Uh, my CPT and those, I'll put the slides on my blog later. Um, so quick overview. We're going to do a quick intro, what is SC Linux? Uh, then Mac versus DAC, we'll get there. Uh, then into a bit about context, roles, types, uh, users, and then different things that you can run into, and why and how you can fix them. Uh, and then a few examples at the end. Uh, so this is perfect. Just last night at dinner, the final, like, final release of 2.9 was out. Like release candidates have been for the last few weeks. Uh, so literally at dinner this was done, so this is awesome. Uh, new version's out, um, not a huge update. Some of the other ones had more things. Uh, one of the notable features is that we made Python 3 by default. It does not use Python 2 anymore by default. You can still turn that on if you want, but, uh, well, Python 2 is going, so please don't. <laughs> um, there are other fun things recently in SC Linux. The kernel has added stacking of LSMs. So now you can have, or not quite yet, but very soon you'll be able to have SC Linux, Mac, AppArmor, like many of these enabled all at the same time. I'm not entirely sure why you would want to, but you can. And it's better for distros, so they can just compile all of them in, and then users can switch by just changing a boot argument. So it'll be quite nice. Um, so, we talk about SC Linux. What is it? It's security enhanced Linux. Um, it controls access between resources, users, files, anything on your computer. Um, and the notable difference between SC Linux versus other things is that it is a Mac, mandatory access control. So, it, um, it's a global policy set on the entire computer. Everything has to obey it. Like the kernel will enforce it. Uh, there are other things that will understand SC Linux and enforce other things, but so those would be Dbus or System D or those kind of things will enforce extra things on top. But the kernel will enforce most things, and it sandboxes different applications so they cannot access things they're not supposed to. They only get things they get. Um, so when you try to access something on your computer, like you try to have a program trying to read a file, it has several security checks along the way. So first it will um, check the regular Unix permissions, so like the read, write, execute bits. If those are allowed, then it will proceed down the pipe and then go to the LSM, which is the Linux security modules. There are more than one of those already, and there will be even more of them in the future when that new patch has landed. Um, and it will basically check them all in order. Like, the LSMs can register certain hooks, so they could be, like, read file, these kind of things, and they will check the system as the Linux policy before allowing it. So it will go, it will start at regular Unix permissions and then keep going. If at any point in time any of those fail, it'll fail and you'll get an audit log entry. Um, if all of them succeed, then you'll be allowed to do it. Um, so you need to know this order because if you are getting permission denied and maybe it's an SC Linux problem, but it might not be, maybe your Unix permissions are wrong, and then you won't see an SC Linux problem because they never got there. It'll only actually show those errors if you get that far in the pipe, which you may or may not. Um, you cannot en enable things. SC Linux is denied by default everything, and then you can add rules to allow things, 
but only within SELA. If it doesn't get there, it's never going to get there. Like it just won't. It'll error out early. Um, so you need to know the format of what these types and contexts look like. Everything in SE Linux has a user role type and a sensitivity is optional. Um, so for example, programs or daemons or like Apache or those kind of things will run under the system user. That user is fairly widely, um, has quite a lot of permissions. Well, all right, no. Users don't have permissions. Users are allowed to do different roles, and, and different roles are allowed to do different types. So the system, uh, the system user is allowed all the like Apache, SSH, those kind of things, but it is not allowed like X or uh, like if you want to run Chrome, those things it can't do. So there's a very big gap between like system daemons and like user, or user users and um, the roles for those. So then staff, user, and those are what different users will get. So the context is separated by colons. Um, the first part is the user. Next part is uh, user role type and the sensitivity. Uh, a tend to end with underscore u, underscore r, and underscore t. That's just a convention. Like They don't actually have to. If you look at Android, which has S Linux enforcing on everything, they don't do that. They just call them really short. So like their system u is just a u, I think. Um, and it's really short. And we just do it that way, because when you write policies, it's much easier to see and understand. Um, the sensitivity is off on a lot of systems by default. I like it. Um, those are used for MLS and MCS. MLS is the super hard for one if you're the NSA and you really want top secret versus classified versus secret and those things. Uh, that one is really hard to use and basically doesn't work. <laughs> um, I have it kind of working a couple times, but don't really bother. The really useful one is MCS which is uh, multi-category security. So to do any of this, you need to have sensitivity. So multi-category security just has a single one and just kind of ignores it. But then you get all the categories at the end. So if you see the S0, the S1 part, that is the sensitivity part. And then the categories are the C0, C, C. Um, a quick thing about users first um, and roles. So the roles are user, which is most users. Just if you're using the system, not an administrator. Yeah, human users. Um, like you're using Chrome, text editor, command line, whatever, these kind of things. That's a user U and a user R. And those have, like all the types belong to those. So the user role gets all these like um, web browser and those kind of things but it does not get any of them that allows you to switch to any other role. It only has one role and it will never get any other one. Staff is the one that you give to your users that are admin. So the staff role is the one that it's almost identical to user, except it also has sudo and sudo and can switch to the sysadmin role. The sysadmin role is like, has a lot of permission. It can read and write like almost anything. Um, but it does not get the types for like web browsers or those kind of things, because those you really should not ever be running as like a admin. It's kind of the same deal as like people have their normal user and then they'll sudo to root to run sysadmin things. But this is another level that's orthogonal to that. Um, you can have your regular, like I have my JSON user, and then I can sudo root. And then I will be root, but I will not have changed type. I'll still be in the staff role. So then if I try and run things, I will not be allowed, even though I'm root. It doesn't matter because the SE Linux parts say I still can't do it. Um, if I am 
my regular user, I can switch role into this admin and stay as my user. Now if I do that, I still can't really do that much because um, it's still not, like I'm still on root so I can't really do much, but I could switch roles. Um, system R is the one that most daemons and things are under. There are also other specialized roles which are not used super often but can be depending on what you, um, if you had a bigger system or like you wanted different roles to do different things, you could have an audit admin which is the role that can touch the audit subsystem which is a very important subsystem because it gets like log messages from the entire system. So it could potentially get other like private secret, secured data or whatever. So that one is quite separate and confined. Uh, then there's like DB admin and web admin if you want to have a user that can admin the web server or the database but not the rest of the system. You can give them those roles. So then they will be in the, the main type and then they can switch up to the, um, the higher permission role. Um, and sec admin is um, kind of like the audit admin, but dealing with the SLNX policy part. So sec admin can reload the policy and update it. Other people can't. Um, if you run on a normal system, sys admin just gets all of those, and like you just kind of use that one. Like I don't really switch between all because it's only me on my laptop, so um, that's easy. Categories. Categories. These are the fun parts. Um, so it's not a typo. The last part is the sensitivity range. So it's the low and the high. So in this case, the example is, is 0 to S2, which is anything in those ranges of securities I can read. But not anything higher than, well, S2 is the lowest. But if I had like 4 to 5, I could do just those, nothing higher, nothing lower. Um, and then on top of that are the categories. Uh, so then you can have a list of categories or you can have a range. So in the earlier thing, or at the bottom of this, it says C0.1023. That gives me all the categories. So any file with any category, I can read. If I do not have a category, then I can't read it. So by default, you just give the user kind of everything. Um, and since the names are kind of like ugly and not really understandable, you can add there's this other daemon on top which can take these and translate them to like names that you give them. So you can write them in a, like a config file and you could say like category 102 is contracts and 103 is salaries and then when you ls you'll see that instead. Um, so if a file does not have any categories, so in this case at the bottom it's just S0 and nothing, then anyone can read them. If I gave it like C5, then as my staff user that had all the categories, I can still read it. But if I had a different user that didn't have those categories, I wouldn't be able to read it. So you see the staff line, there's the low permission and the high permission. Uh, it doesn't, it, it's meant for the multi-level security. And then multi-category security is just like a compression of that. Yeah, so if you see at the bottom, that, uh, the root, like that's the type on my home directory. That one is implicitly S0 to S0. But it's doubled so you just write it once. But like it's, the, the low and the high are the same thing, so it's only S0. Uh, because MCS doesn't use the categories. MLS, if you wanted to have like S15 as the top secret, and then like S14 could be secret, and then S0 could be like public then you could have, you could log in at different sensitivity levels and you could read um, up. Like if you are secret, you can read public information, but you cannot write to public information. So you can like have different levels and it's kind of really annoying to use. Uh, so I don't really know anyone outside of the NSA that does. Uh, Yes. Uh, yes. So there are X SC Linux extensions, um, which 
does all of that. Most policies just kind of let you do whatever you want. And X11 sucks, so you can just kind of do whatever you want. <laughs> um, but I have seen some things where the window manager will put like red if it's secret and green if it's not and like tag the windows differently. Um, I don't actually know if anybody uses that for real other than like VSD Linux maintainers and developers. Yeah, yeah, but it's, yeah, as in the NSA probably didn't use it, but Fedora doesn't. Um, and I, yes, I've got MLS to work on a console VM. I'm pretty sure this wouldn't work on X, at least like, without like a lot of fixing up the policies. Nobody really uses it much, so it kind of <laughs> isn't great. Um, so another thing people have with SD Linux is they get a lot of errors and they blame SD Linux a lot of the time. Uh, which is sometimes fair and sometimes not. But what is really nice about this is the audit subsystem in the kernel. It actually is not really related to SD Linux. Um, they're used very heavily together, but you could use audit even if you like, don't care at all about SD Linux or have it installed. And you can use it to watch certain directories, files, like audit different events on the system. So SD Linux will publish an audit entry if you do something you're not supposed to. So if you get a denial, it will show up in the audit log. If you don't see it in the audit log, there are two possible reasons. One is that it's being don't audited, where it's like, it's a harmless thing that gets checked, but the program doesn't need it. So these are typically badly written programs. Like I've seen a lot of programs that just like open every single file and zip. Like why would it do that? I don't know, but it clearly doesn't need to do that. Um, it only needs this one file in like slash etc something, its own config file, but it will just stat every single file anyway. And then you're gonna get an odd, like you're gonna get a denial for every single file in there. So you could give it to the program, but that's probably not a good idea. So then you can just don't audit the thing and make it go away. And it won't show up and pull you a lot. Um, or it didn't happen with SD Linux. Like, see, if you get denied something, it doesn't work, and you don't see an audit entry, then you can turn off don't audit, run SD module dash D, or DB, to rebuild it, load it again without any of the don't audits in. Then, if you still don't see it, it might be not an SD Linux issue. Like, it might be that your Unix permissions were wrong, uh, like the beginning. Then, so you can take, AU searches, search the audit logs, so you can say, search the ABC entries and give me them from today or recent or some time frame in it. So if you say dash today, it's gonna give you all the ones that happened like today. And then you can just list them out and they look kind of like that line underneath. Or you can pipe them into audit QY, which will take an audit entry and then give you a more English-like explanation. Uh, they're not necessarily great explanations. In this case, the example is actually like completely the wrong solution. Um, what's happened here is var dub 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 HTML is where you put your websites. So the S context in this is the source, and the T context is the target. So the source is Apache running under HTTP. The T context is, in this case, the file or the directory that it was trying to read. So you look at the context, you see it's labeled user home T. So it probably shouldn't be labeled user home T. User home T, even if you don't know anything about Linux or SD Linux at all, probably doesn't sound like a website file. So this audit to Y goes, well, you're trying to read a user home file. There is a Boolean to do that. So you can set the Boolean, turn it on, then Apache will be allowed to read user home file. And this would then work but that's the wrong solution. You should just fix the labels on that file because that file should be labeled like web server files, which are HTTP disk content. I'm trying to think, like in the usual case, pretty much yes. You may have some things, like you can do labeled 
networking, so you can like the packet equivalent wire can have context, but I'm trying to think maybe you could do weird things there. But in the general case of things you will encounter in normally, yeah, pretty much. It's it's yeah. the it's the user or something. Yeah, 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 yeah. Like there may be some edge cases, but I can't think of them right now. So yes, mostly. Huh? So if you pipe it, there's actually several different things going on. One is that descriptor from another um, on the other side of the pipe. So there's a permission used with file descriptor. And then have the permissions for read and write. You could have it set up so you can take the file descriptor from the other process and read it, but you would not be able to write back to it or something like that if you wanted to. Um, so, pretty much anything you need to do to administrate an XLNX system is done with SEMAN. There are a couple other tools, um, but really just like this one. So a lot of the other tools are kind of like older tools. They were written first or smaller, and they do only part of it. And now SEMAN just kind of does everything. So like there's an S set SE bool to turn on off Boolean, but there's also SE manage Boolean, which will turn on off Boolean. So you can just do that instead. Um, if you run SE manage dash dash help, it'll list all of them. There are more, they wouldn't fit on the slide. You can do InfiniBand stuff. You can set different contexts and things on the different parts of InfiniBand, which I don't really, I've never done InfiniBand, so I don't really know how that works, but um, you could. Uh, there's a bunch of networking options you can set labeled networking, which is like on the wire, it'll include the context on the packets, so the other system can understand it. Um, you can then also have, you can set firewall rules and say any packets coming from this IP address get labeled as this, and that stays within your system. Uh, there's a bunch of other ones which are like, I never use them, ever, so. There's, there, it's Calypso, or it's Calypso and Cypso or something, for IPv4 and six. So it's, it's an RFC for it, you can read it. it, it like it's an RFC for a thing, it's, so you don't have to use Red Linux, you can use something else, but I obviously would use it for that. Um, so, but then their packets coming back would not have them, so your system would throw those packets away. Because you can set up a daemon, like, you could set up, for example, if you had a public web server and a top secret web server, you could have the top secret web server running under like a different one, and that one you could make only accept labeled packets uh, from like your secure network and the other one could be public network and things like that. Um, it's not super commonly used, but you can do that. Uh, the most common ones you'll need are obviously the user logins, the first one. Ports, if you're doing networking stuff. Uh, and then file contacts, the big one. And booleans, which I covered booleans a lot in the previous year talk, so you can watch those. Um, Logins and users are a little bit complicated to understand at first. You have to realize that there are Linux users, which are your regular Linux users. Then there are SC Linux users, which typically end with underscore U, not always. In the root case, there is the system Linux user called root. There is also an entry called root that is an SC Linux user. And then there's the category range and things like that. So this SE managed login maps SC Linux users to login users. So in this case, root will, when they log in, they get the SC Linux user root. And people in wheel get staff, and everyone else gets users. You could set things up if you wanted someone to run under like the database admins group. You could put their username specifically, and then they'd get the database admin one. Or you can set a group, so the percent in the front means it's a group, so the wheel group. Um, users are what's related to the whole user role mapping. So different roles can do different things. So this is how you give someone different sets of them. So user U uh, gets the SC Linux role user R and nothing else, and it gets the lowest range. It can't really do categories. Um, system U kind of gets everything, but no 
of time. Um, staff gets all the categories if you use that. If you have MCS or MLS turned off, that, that column will just be gone. Um, but you'll see under SA link roles, there's now two things. So staff U will get staff R first. When they log in, you'll get that one. But you are also allowed to switch to any of the other ones. So you could add database admin and things too. Or you could make a new DB admin user and then add the database admin role later and have the staff one first or something like that. Um, like order matters in that list. Um, so switching roles, if you switch to root, you can do that. But you'll actually get an error when you sue that it can't read your home directory because on SEO Link, the home directory is labeled different for root versus the other users. So I kind of omitted that to fit on the slide. Um, and then if you try to do things, you'll just get like tons of errors, like nothing will work. And if you look at your like ID-Z, SNX is early enough that we managed to claim dash Z on almost everything. So all the tools, dash Z will show the SNX context. LS dash LZ will show the context on the files, ID dash Z or netstat dash Z or whatever, they'll show all of them. So if you look at that, you're still staff. But you're running as root Linux users. So then you can new role to, to sysadmin R, and then you can put your ID, and now it will have changed. So the staff U at the prime, that never, ever, ever changes. You can only change that by logging in again as some other user. You can change your role, though. The roles, like one user can have many different roles, and then within the role, you get a main type. So you can give someone a user, and then they can switch between the roles they have, like their administrator versus their normal user, and they can do that. Um, but no matter how many times you sue or sudo, you'll keep the first part. That one doesn't change. Um, but this kind of sucks, so you can just use sudo. It understands I feel like, and you can do sudo dash r dash t to give it the role and the type. Uh, and then it will do it when you just sudo. That also kind of sucks, so you can just add it in the sudo file and say anyone that's in the wheel group will automatically do type sysadmin role sysadmin. If you do that, then like sudo dash s will just do, like, it'll just work as far as things are concerned. Like, when you switch to root, you're also going to switch to sysadmin user. Um, you can also specify them manually if you want, like, if you are a normal thing and you want to do the database admin stuff, you can then specify the database admin role and type. Uh, yeah, so those are special. They run through PAM as well, so PAM is special. Um, but stuff like su and sudo, like, there's a whole bunch of really tight security on those programs. Um, when they fork, they'll make another subprocess in the other one, but like they're, they, they have the ability to set, like to change it during that transition. And there's a bunch of like extra labels on those, so they're all categorized in the policy so you can search for them. And there's constraints set in the policy, so if something that tries to do that, if you try and give some random program the ability to change type, you'll fail the policy compile because the constraint rules won't allow you to do that. You also need to give it the like the type or the attribute to allow it to change roles and types. Just so that like you can't accidentally do it, you need to be very like really, really specific when you do that. Um, so sudo is a lot nicer. You just add the thing at the bottom and it kind of works. Um, that's for your user. If you want to run other programs and other domains, normally there are um, types on the files. So like rsync might be rsync exec t. And then when you run it, there'll be a type transition. Like when staff runs it, this executable type, it'll, when it runs that program, it'll run it in the destination type. I covered this a lot more in last year's talk. Um, if you don't have a type transition and you want to do it manually, you can run con. Or if there is a type transition but you want to go to a different one. Like maybe SSH will go to SSH T but you really don't for some reason, you can then run con something else. Um, it's useful during policy development if you haven't like put all the transition stuff in yet or if you're trying to screw around. But it is quite useful. So this is the type 
Like you can do run con dash t. It'll keep your user in your role and it'll set the type on it. And these types, oh, the associated types, a set one that doesn't, like they need to be associated at least a little bit. The transition cannot be there and you can switch to it. But if the type is not associated with it, you can't do it. So like HTTP is the Apache type. Staff role cannot run that. That's not a thing. So if you try to run con dash t, HTTP t, t, it won't run. Like it'll try and compute the context. It'll say staff u, staff r, HTTP, and then it'll just fail and not run it. If you want to run system stuff, there's another thing in front called run init, which does a whole bunch of stuff. It'll ask your password first and then do some more funny things. And then it will get to init t, which is init, and then when you run it, there is a transition from init to the HTTP t daemon, and then that will look good. But if you just, as your normal user, run Apache virtual start, it probably won't work. Um, you might nowadays, but like systemd has these better things where you can like figure it out, but um, if you just try and run the server binary, like Apache directly, it just probably won't at all work. Um, so, if you want to do strange things with users, if you had a finance department and you wanted to keep the finance stuff separate from everyone else, you can set categories on the files of finance things. You could give them zero to 127. So the zero dot 127 is a range. If it's zero comma 127, then it's category zero and category 127. If it's zero dot 127, it's zero, one, two, three, four, up to 127. Um, so in this case, you make a finance U, and you give it a different set of categories, and then you just give it the user role again. The role stuff you can just inherit and keep the stats all the same. You just set the categories and the sensitivity on it, and then it's a whole new set of things, and it'll just work really nicely. Then you would need to set that new finance U user on Alex or Bob or whatever, and then you would need to reset the home directory of that user. Because if the home directory was still on user u and the user types, and then they log in, they log in before they read the file system. Like they're gonna log in and become finance u with like whatever those roles are. Then they're gonna try and read their home directory in bash rc and that's gonna fail and they're kinda not gonna get. So you need to reset that too. Like they're they're quite different. Like every single thing has a different label on it. You need to like keep track of them all. It's not usually that hard. You just kind of reset everything. But the store con will read the policy that has defined the context and then set those like back to default. Um, R is recursive. V is verbose. The F is force. So there are certain types that are marked as customizable. Um, like users want to change things in their home directory, maybe like their downloads folder is somewhere else and they want to label that one as a downloads folder because Chrome can only write to the downloads folder, it can't write anywhere else. So if I try to save something in the home directory, that won't work. But if I also wanted to save it to a different downloads folder and I set that, if you restore con without the force and that type is marked as a customizable type, like the downloads directory is, then it won't change it. If it's, if you use a dash F to force it, it'll just overwrite all of them back to default. So I like to um, force them, or I like to add them to the policy and then just force everything. Because then I keep track of what I've done and what I haven't. But if you're on a multi-user system and like only one like IT admin has this permission, then you would probably use customizable types a lot more. Um, the file contexts on these files are stored in extended attributes on the file system. You need to know that they're there as extended attributes. If you're backing up your system and you don't turn on backup for X adders, depending on the tool, you won't get labeled. Which means when you restore, you could just like reset all the types back to default. And that's probably fine, but it might not be. So if you're doing your backup, most different tools have a way to keep the type what it was. So if you do CP, and copy something, 
it's making a new file and then writing the contents over. So that's gonna use the type inheritance of like the parent directory. If that's something else and you don't wanna do that, then you would do preserve contents. And then it'll copy it over. If you do cp p or whatever it is, it'll just preserve everything. It'll preserve timestamp and all the other things, so then you'll get the context as well. But uh, otherwise you need to do it individually. rsync has an X adders one, so it'll do SC Linux and everything else. R has separate flags for regular X adders and SC Linux. Because sometimes if you're restoring things back and you don't have permission to write certain types of SC Linux labels, you can't write them back but you might want the other uh, extend attribute. So you can pass back to Linux par and it'll save them. Um, if you want to change them temporarily, you chcon to change context, just like ch owner or ch uh, group or whatever. This will change the context. If you do dash t, it'll do the type. Dash l will be the level. If you don't give anything, you can give all the whole thing spelled out, and then it'll set that. You can also do dash dash reference, and it'll, um, right. if you do dash dash reference, you can read the type from another file and set it, and then you restore con to set everything back. If you want to do it permanently, which is the way I like to do it, um, you can SC manage S context, and then you give it the type and the directory regex. So this regex is an actual regex that you can set different like paths under it, matching only certain things or whatever, and then it'll set that type on it. So if you move Apache's directory, normally it's under var www, but you want to put it under server or something else, then you can set the type on it. And then you restore con, and things might still not quite work right, because we have other types underneath. Like CGI bin is labeled differently from the base one. And then like an uploads directory is marked as read write, whereas the regular ones are only read only. So if you actually look for var dub 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 in like my laptop file contact file, you get 24 of them. So you could set them all manually in that new directory, but that's kind of a pain in the ass. Like if you add one in the policy, you won't get it. So there's also a dash equal or dash dash equal or dash e. So you can say SRV www is exactly equivalent to var www. So when it tries to label a file in there, it will just realize, oh, it's that. Let me look up here instead. So that is how we support like user lib 64, user lib 32, and these kind of things. They're just handled by that. You set the equal one, and then you set a S context on SRV www. It will not see that one. When it reads the path, Then it will automatically happen. Yes. Yes. It, it'll it'll rewrite the thing. Yep. Um. Almost done. Uh. Ports. A lot of people run ports or run servers, and run things on ports. There are the standard ports, which are labeled different things, and then there are other. Sometimes you want to run on another port for whatever reason, to get less spam. Uh. If that's not labeled, and it's Port 80 and 443 and these ones are labeled as port, HTTP port type. So then Apache is allowed to bind to those ports and connect to those ports and do all that kind of thing. If you want to put Apache on port 8081, that's not in the policy. So then you can add port 8081 TCP to that port type locally without having to edit the policy. Um, just on your machine. Then after that, Apache can bind it's fine. So set that, restart Apache, it'll work fine. Um, mostly done, thank you. Uh, SLinux, GitHub is there. The SLinux coloring book is awesome. Uh, I talked about it in my first talk. Um, otherwise, the wikis are pretty good. Sensu and Fedora have a lot of information on them. So the point with SLinux is that it's mandatory access set globally by the administrator on the entire system. Users cannot change it. DAC permissions are discretionary access where the user can do what they want. So if in my home directory I set everything to like chmod 777, then anyone can read my stuff. Uh, but you still need those permissions. You can't get rid of them. Because like there's, 
ABS Linux would allow something, but you want to lock it down even more, you can just use Unix permissions on that. Or you can't get rid of SC Linux because discretionary, the problem with them is the user can shoot themselves in the foot. If they see it, want everything, then the system can read it. If you have SC Linux on top, then even if the user sets 777, you can't read it. So, no. Yep. So I have, Steam will only use like dot local share Steam and dot whatever. No, 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 on my system it cannot do anything else. Uh, so I have set the main Steam binary to Steam T, and then there are no transitions out of that. There is no way once you get into that to get anywhere else. And then I've given the Steam domain permissions for like the graphics to use that, use whatever, and only write to those small directories. It can't write anywhere else. Because I'm sure you heard some time ago there was this Steam bug, or bug. When you upgrade Steam, it would nuke your entire system. <laughs> It is arm.rf everything. Uh, yeah, so I can't, that, that can't happen now for me, which is nice. Um, it's, it mostly works on my machine, but I haven't upstreamed the policy yet. Uh, I could do that, it's not terribly complicated. I let it read for like, oh, we have uh, nice macros to help with like DNS lookups, you need to read resolve comp and those things, so it's easy to give a domain those kind of accesses really quickly.